Open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. So as you're turning to Mark chapter 5, let me ask you this. Why, why do we ask questions? Seems like a silly question, actually. Curious, we want an answer. It's usually because there's something we don't know and we want to find out. So we ask the question. And uh, so, what if Jesus is the one that asks the question? Now, since he's God in the flesh and he's omniscient, there is nothing that he doesn't know. So why would he ask anything? Well, in the, in the verses that we're going to look at here tonight, we are going to see two very different healings take place. Both have similarities and differences. Both present some vital issues that we need to see and to believe. And if we do see and believe, I, I believe, I pray, I hope, then we may be able to experience even more freedom than we ever have before in the midst of difficult or trying circumstances. That's what I believe. Mark chapter 5, picking up in verse 21, Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for twelve years, and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, for she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. And he took the child by the hand and he said to her, Talitha kumi, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was twelve years of age, and they were overcome by great or with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, and said that something should be given her to eat. What's in a crowd? Point number one. What's in a crowd? People, lots of people, and in this case, a throng. I don't know how many is in a throng. I'm thinking it's more than a dozen. 
What's in the crowd? So here's Jesus. He's back from the country of the Gadarenes. Remember, he had gone over there just to deliver a man from demonic possession. Now he sails back, and apparently this crowd either knew that he was coming back or anticipated his return, and there they are, a crowd, a multitude. Now, Jesus is being mobbed here, thronged as it were, and it's becoming a real common occurrence for him, and it's really testing the limits of his own disciples. You see what they said down there in verse 31. His disciples said, you see the multitude thronging you, and yet you say, who touched me? So I'm, I just cannot help but think that there's a part of them that says, gee, this is great. Jesus is so popular. And another part of them that's saying, man, I'm getting sick and tired of all of these all of these crowds, you know, how many of you really love to get out there and rub elbows with all the shoppers at Christmas time at Macy's or something like that? You know, I can take about five minutes of that before I start running out of gas. And as with any crowd of people, there would be various needs represented by the people of that crowd. It's like there's various needs that are represented here tonight. Some of you have need of one thing, some of you another. In this crowd, there were two that created the storyline. There's a man with a sick child, and there's a woman with a chronic illness. Any of you guys, you don't have to raise your hand, ever had, suffered through, or know anyone that has a chronic illness. It's not pleasant. Now, the incredulous disciples were justifiably confounded at how Jesus could detect one single person out of this multitude that was thronging him. Now, in the case that we have here before us, we've got a man that came to Jesus on behalf of someone else, Jairus. He comes on behalf of his daughter. His daughter is ill, and he thinks, okay, if I can get Jesus to come over to the house, she'll be healed and she'll be okay. And there's a woman who is seeking Jesus for herself, although she's doing it uh, with stealth. She doesn't want to be seen or, or known for it. One openly and publicly, one privately and quietly, if you will. The only similarity at this point in the narrative is that they both knew that Jesus was the answer to their need. I, I still wonder sometimes if we really genuinely see Jesus that way, if we really see him as the answer to our need. You know, what's your need? Finances. Jesus is the answer. No, he's not. Money is the answer. No, Jesus is the answer. Well, I need a physical healing. Jesus is the answer. No, I need to go to the hospital. I need to be diagnosed. I need to have a procedure. I need to, you know, that's sometimes I think if we don't verbalize it that way, at least mentally, privately we're thinking that you know what i need right now is my yeah i know i got jesus i know i know i know i got jesus but what i need right now is money well if you got jesus you kind of you yeah you kind of have everything you need it's not like he's broke right i mean it's, he owns cattle on a thousand hills i've told him many times lord you own cattle on a thousand hills i just need you to sell a couple of them for me that's all much like the friends of the paralytic. Remember the paralytic back in Mark chapter 2 whose friends brought him to Jesus, even hacked a hole in the roof of the building so they could lower him through. Whatever the question, whatever the need, Jesus is the answer. Uh, I, while I was studying this and thinking about this, I was instantly reminded of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, where we are reminded and encouraged at the same time for all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen to the glory of God through us. What's God going to do for you? Yes and amen. God's promises all this stuff to us. Is that for real? Yes and amen. Amen. So be it. It will be that. Yeah, that's, that's what it's for. But before Jesus would do anything for these two people, Jairus and his daughter, or this woman, before Jesus would even enter the picture for either one of them, there had to be suffering. 
There had to be suffering. That's point number two. Why must there be suffering? Here's this young girl, verse 22 to 27. One of the rulers of the synagogue came by, Jairus. Look at his plea. My little daughter lies at the point of death. We find out that she's 12 years old. Interesting, too, to note how long this woman had suffered with the flow of blood. 12 years. Interesting. i got nothing to say about it. It's just interesting. I love those little connections that God's Word makes. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. Here's a guy who's crying out for his daughter. I think most of you here have kids. I, I don't personally. I don't have children. I told somebody one time, they said, you got kids? I said, no, I got employees. I was a salon owner at the time. That's what it felt like anyways. Salon. I owned a salon at the time. And who, for a sick child, would not do anything and everything? We were talking about this a little bit on Tuesday night. How, you know, we would, I would have gladly, happily taken Carol's cancer. I, I, I would not have thought for a nanosecond otherwise. And for those of you that have children, if you've ever seen your child suffer, man, it's, I can't imagine the, the weight, the heartbreak that there would be in seeing your own children suffer. But there's a problem here with Jairus. And uh, that is that he is called here in verse 22, one of the rulers of the synagogue. Oops. This is problematic because the synagogue rulers and religious leaders were all lining up against Jesus. Now we know throughout all four of the Gospels, not all of them did, but the overwhelming majority of them, and certainly those that had the greatest power. Now I wonder if this isn't a good example of something here. Jairus, a synagogue ruler, when all of his peers are lining up against Jesus. A synagogue ruler, all those that worked with him, worked for him, and worked above him, were all lining up against Jesus. And there's Jairus. And something happens to him that makes him do something that he might not have done otherwise. Now, we don't, we don't know anything about Jairus other than this story right here. We don't know if he had been secretly listening to Jesus. We don't know if he had been publicly saying, hey, I think there's something to this guy. We don't know what his position is on Jesus before this point. But whatever his position was before this point, something drove him to step away from all of his peers, all of those that worked with him, all those that worked for him, all those that worked above him, to step away from that because he had something on his heart and on his mind that was far greater than religious affiliation. So I just wonder if this isn't an example of no matter what you believe, there are going to be times when your faith will be tested to the uttermost. I heard somebody say one time years ago, and I believe it's true, that a faith that is not worth testing is a faith that is not worth having. Now, again, and I know I've brought this up to you before, when Carol was sick, even when things were getting really difficult and bad, people would ask me about it and I would tell them what we're going through and, and what's happening. And they would say, boy, you know, it's, just, it's so, just so good to see you keeping a positive attitude. And I said, oh, no, no. This is not a positive attitude. A positive attitude ran out of gas a long time ago. Because if you put a positive attitude to a test... And there comes a point where a positive attitude in the midst of a test becomes self-delusion. You get it? It's like, oh no, you know, everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be great while everything's going right downhill rapidly. 
<coughs> oh no, I believe everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be great. No, it's not. Everything's not going to be great. <coughs> As a matter of fact, in life, most things are going to end up bad at one point or the other. I uh, Sometimes I think we do kids a disservice when we tell them, you know, in, in this life you can accomplish anything you set your mind to. No, you can't. You can't accomplish anything you set your mind to. You can accomplish an awful lot if you work hard and if you try. And if you don't try, you'll never know. But you can't say you can accomplish anything you want in this world. Just set your mind to it. Okay, well, I want to be able to fly without an airplane. So I'm just going to set my mind to it. Well, it doesn't work. And at some point or the other, no matter what you believe, you're going to run into a test that's going to stretch the limits of your faith, and your faith is either going to break or it's going to work. It's going to, it's going to sustain you, if you will. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4 is the primary text on this topic. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I know I've told you guys this before. I remember reading that early in my Christian life and thinking, what a stupid thing to say. <laughs> you know, count it all joy when you encounter various trials? <laughs> no. <laughs> but you know, in life you do. And there's a reason why. And this is the thing that, that changed my mind about the passage. It's not counted all joy when you encounter various trials. That's just positive thinking. Oh, it's going to be okay. Everything's going to be all right. You know what people like to say. It's all good. <clears throat> well, no, it's not. It's not all good, and some of it's really bad. So when it's really bad, you can't say it's all good. That is self-delusion. But what the passage says is we can count it all joy when we fall into various trials knowing, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. There's a reason. Boy, I'm telling you, it's so much easier to suffer when there's a reason. Have you ever known anybody that was suffering physically with some sort of an illness, but they didn't have a diagnosis? And just the angst that comes from not knowing what the cause is. Why do I feel this way? Why am I sick? Why do I have pain? And the doctors are going, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know. And then when you finally do get a diagnosis, it's almost a relief to know. Okay, we know what it is now. You know, you're only going to live for another hour. Well, that's okay. At least I know. You know it's, it's, I'm, it's not a mystery any longer. It's important to know. And when we encounter various trials, no matter what, when our faith is stretched to the uttermost, which it will be, we know that there's a reason why. We know it's going to produce something good and godly in our lives. We were talking about this on the, uh, in the Tuesday night men's study. And I thought it was a brilliant discussion because we were talking about what people say a lot. And people do say this, God will never allow you to be tested beyond your capacity. God will never give you anything you can't handle. I've even said that before. God will never give you more than you can handle. And I think that's a lie. I don't think that... No, it doesn't. It says beyond what you're able. It says you will, no you will not be tempted beyond your capacity to resist. That's a temptation. That's not the same thing. Will God give you more than you can handle? Yes, frequently. Frequently. Stronger. What happens? It makes you stronger, but why does it make you stronger? Because Grows your faith. Forces you to lean on Him more. That's what happens. See, as long as we're not, as long as we're not being tested beyond our abilities, we'll always rest on our abilities. We'll always have our abilities to figure the thing out. And, you know, guys, men are especially like this. I'll figure it out. I know how to figure it out. Here's problem. Here's solution. Boom, put it together. Situation resolved. But when you're tested beyond your capacity, you look at the thing and say, I don't, I don't know. 
I don't know what to do. I can't do anything. There's nothing that I can do. I, I don't know what to do. That's great. That's awesome. That's a great place to be. Horribly uncomfortable. Terribly uncomfortable. Yeah. That's basically what happened to the Israelites in the Red Sea. That's it. Basically, nothing they can do about it. Nothing they can do. And, and you know, uh, uh, was it just in the movie? Was it the, just the Charlton that said yeah. this? Or was it uh, stand still and see the salvation? Well, that's what God's Word says. Yeah. yeah, you know, the funny thing is... Yeah. Charlton Heston and Moses. The, you know, the funny thing about that, if I may comment, is Moses is the one that said, stand, stand still and see. God is the one that said, get up and move. You strike the water, don't stand there, move. I really like that. And it's one of the things that's always resonated with me when I find myself in a position where my faith is being tested to the uttermost. And you know what that is? Is keep putting one foot in front of the other. Sometimes that's all you can do. Sometimes that's all you got. It's funny, too, when God says, you know, the psalmist says, your word is a, a, light, to my, uh, a, a light to my path, a lamp to my feet. You know, if you're in the dark and you're carrying a lamp, how far can you see? Um, about a step. <laughs> that's it. One step at a time. So sometimes all you got is one step at a time. So will God stretch your faith to the uttermost? Absolutely. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. The same thing is echoed in Romans chapter 5, another passage I know that you're familiar with because you're a biblically literate church. God bless you. And uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. There's another one of those statements. <clears throat> glory in tribulations. And here's that word again, knowing. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character and character hope. There's a reason. There's a reason. Then there is something that's going to be produced out of it. Now, if you're not a Christian, <coughs> if you've never been born again by the Spirit of God, then the tests of your faith, as your faith is tested to the uttermost, produces nothing. There's nothing that's produced by it. Oh, you might learn a good lesson. I hope you do. It'd be stunned if you didn't. But there's no knowing, as God's word tells us that we can know. So then, when your faith is tested to the uttermost, which we know that everybody's faith will be, no matter what you believe, when your faith is tested to the uttermost, then what becomes of what you believe? Does it stand up? Does what you believe is it still there or is it just collapsed in ruins because what you believe did not sustain you when it was tested to the uttermost now Jairus Jairus back to Jairus again synagogue ruler the kind of atmosphere that he lived and worked in every single day as a synagogue ruler Jairus in order to come to Jesus he had to step out and away from what he was associated with <coughs> to find Jesus. There came a point where all of that, all of that religion, I, it's not going to get me to where I need to go. It's not going to help me. It doesn't do anything for me at this point, but he does. He's got something that none of this over here has all of this religion and all of the edifice of the temple and and all of the ceremony and all of the formality and all of that it's got nothing for me right now and i need something else and he is something else jesus is way something else now this is also a reminder when we look at jairus here this is also a reminder that coming to Jesus, you cannot drag your old religion with you. So whatever religion you may have been raised with, uh, whatever religion you may have associated yourself with before you became a Christian, it just really does not translate over. Uh, you know, you hate to tell people, and we have to be mindful, you know, when we're sharing our faith with people, because 
what we're what we're really asking them to do is we're asking them to abandon everything that they've ever believed. So you can't just say, hey, you know, come to Jesus. It's like you got to think about that. You got to think about what it means to come to Jesus. That means I have to deny or abandon the way that I was raised. I have to deny or abandon my entire culture, my entire history, my my uh, my. Uh, ethnic heritage. I have to deny all of that to come to Jesus. You can't drag all of your old religion over into Jesus. Now, Jairus, driven by his desperation, believed one thing. And he told Jesus the very thing that he believed. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. That's all he knew. If you touch her, notice he didn't go to the high priest. He didn't take his daughter to the temple. He said to Jesus, if you touch her, and Jesus consents to go. Okay, let's go. Now the backstory raises some other questions. And the backstory isn't here. But as usual, where scripture is silent, I always feel free to speculate. <laughs> Don't tell anyone I said that. That's probably not a wise thing. But I get, I think about these things. I almost see these stories, especially the Gospel of Mark, almost in a cinematic way. I see the people and I see the dialogue and I see how this is playing out. And I wonder, I wonder, as Jairus comes to Jesus, my little daughter uh, lies ill, I wonder how long had she been sick? Now, I wonder what she had. What was it? Was it a, a sickness? Was it an injury? Is, she said she lies sick. She, or she lay, uh, she, uh, my little daughter lies uh, at the point of death. What had happened to her? Or, or how long had she been suffering? Was this fairly immediate? Or had she been suffering for, the long, for a long time? Had they tried other means of healing. Now we're going we're to talk about the woman with the issue of blood here in just a minute. But had you know, I'm I'm just I'm guessing here that as any father would, he spared no expense in getting the best medical care that he could possibly get for his daughter, and nothing. And then, how about this one? Why would God allow a 12-year-old girl? to suffer and die. How about that one? You ever heard somebody say that to you? I have. Lots of times. Then I started asking him, why would God allow anyone to die? Oh, that's, that's different. See, it's not so much a question. Everybody, oh yeah, people die. People die all the time. 12-year-old girls die all the time. It happens all around the world in various circumstances. 12-year-old children die. But this is my child. See, that's different. That's different. I don't care about all those other 12-year-old girls in the world. This is my 12-year-old girl. And who can blame a dad? I wouldn't for that. And that doesn't even take into consideration not only the anguish of her father, which is fairly evident, how about his wife, the little girl's mom? How about any other brothers or sisters or anybody else that's associated with the family, extended family, neighbors, friends? Oh, oh, that Jairus' daughter. Oh, I just feel so bad for those people. Isn't there anything we can do for them? No, let's cook them a meal and we'll take it over there for them because they're just, they're spending everything they got on taking care of their little girl, right? Right? So everybody that is surrounding Jairus and his family is a part of this thing too. Now, Jesus consents to go. So he says, okay, let's go. And as they proceed to Jairus' house, there is another in the crowd who is seeking Jesus for similar reasons. Now, a certain woman, verse 25, had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. See, they had HMOs back then. <laughs> Spent everything she had and only grew worse. You know, I love science. 
I love medical technology. I love all of that stuff. And I would rather be living in the here and now than any time in history. Because remember, they used to not have anesthesia. We're going to have to take the leg. Bite on this. <laughs> now here's a woman, not a child. She suffered as long as this child's been alive. 12 years of this flow of blood. And we don't know exactly what this flow of blood is. I've always speculated in my own mind that it had something to do with her menstrual cycle. That's, that's just speculative on my part. But man, oh man, bleeding for 12 years, that's a problem. Can't imagine how weak or how much suffering there would be. She had, as verse 26 says, uh, suffered many things from many physicians. She had spared no expense nor effort in trying to find help for herself. She couldn't find it. Nothing was working. Everything that she had tried failed. Jairus, everything that they'd tried, failed. So, let's think about this for a second. We're a thinking church. Let's think about this for a second. Have you ever been in a situation where it seems as if your prayers are being ignored? You keep praying and praying and praying and nothing's happening. I've been there. Matter of fact, I, I thought for a time I'm just going to stop praying because the more, the more I pray, the worse it gets. I'm just going to stop praying altogether. And there's encouragements in Scripture. Luke 18, 1, you know, pray at all times and not lose heart. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. And I'm so blessed, <clears throat> once again looking back oh, those years, that nobody in this church came up to me and tried to pull that one on me. Oh, you know, come on, Brian, you got to pray without ceasing. Oh, you got to pray and not lose heart. Nobody tried to do that here with me. Probably because we were all suffering the same way. You know, we're all praying. It's like, it's not working. Because sometimes the encouragements of Scripture just aren't encouraging. Sometimes it's just all bad, it's all dark. The encouragements of Scripture aren't happening. People trying to encourage you, you're not being encouraged, you're praying, you're praying, things just getting worse, things seem to be being ignored. And we have two people here in our narrative that are facing just such a thing, Jairus and this woman. And for reasons of their own, they both come to Jesus. For reasons of their own, they get in their head that he's the one that I need to deal with. <clears throat> I've done everything else. Now I'm going to Jesus, which is a funny thing because we do the same thing. <laughs> I know you guys don't, but we do, we do the same thing. Oh, you know, I've tried everything. I guess I'll just pray. I guess, I guess I'm just going to have to pray as if that's the, like the last worst thing to do when in fact it's the first and the best thing to do. It's funny, I think, and this is just me, but I think we trust and we believe in prayer all the more when we lead with prayer as opposed to falling back on prayer, if you know what I'm saying. Because it's really easy to get into a situation and, as again, as a, especially as a man, to try to figure it out. I'm going to figure out the situation. And then when I can't figure out the situation, then I start to pray. Rather than lead with prayer. And at the first sign of something that I cannot manage, I think, ooh, you know, I don't know what this is. I better pray. I better pray now. <clears throat> I think things, at least for me, have gone very differently when I lead with prayer as opposed to fall back on prayer. Does that make sense? To make, to make prayer the point, you know, the front edge. You know, um, you guys have seen videos before 
of the great ice breaking ships and how the, the nose of the ship is built in a particular way so that when it hits the ice, it just cleaves the ice. And, and I almost have this vision in my mind of prayer being that way. When we lead with prayer, prayer kind of cleaves the ice so that we can make a little bit more progress as opposed to something we fall back on. Now, when we look at, when we look at Jairus and we, we look at the woman with the issue of blood, they're both coming to Jesus after years of desperation Jairus were not sure how long she had been suffering but there was suffering in both cases before they came to Jesus why would God allow that to happen why would God allow these people to suffer that way oh yeah we know people suffer all the time why would God allow people to suffer that way well you know, the definitive passage is in John chapter 9 you might want to turn there John chapter 9 you guys know where I'm going with this John chapter 9, the first seven verses. Now, <clears throat> as Jesus passed by, he saw a man, a man, not a child, not a boy, a man, who was blind from birth. Can you imagine giving birth to a baby? And there's just so much joy because a baby is born. And, and you know, it's a it's a man child. You've got a boy here. Oh, prized in that culture, certainly. <clears throat> you got a man child. Then the child opens its eyes and you realize it can't see. What a tragic thing. Anybody would call that a tragedy, right? Anybody would call that a tragedy. And so here's this man, born blind. And it's funny. Because the very first thing that his disciples come up with is what we would call karma. It's, a, it's Hinduism 101. What did, look at what they say there, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. In other words, he got what he deserved because somebody messed up. Right? That's how it happens. That's why... 12-year-old girls get sick and die because someone messed up somewhere. This is just karma. These people must be bad people because they're just getting back what they gave, right? Previous life or whatever, dad was a drug dealer and now look what happened to us. You know, what did he expect being a drug dealer and everything? You know, who knows? People think karma. That's why it happened, or they just scratch their heads and walk away. And so the disciples, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. And Jesus answered, neither. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Wow. Huh. I don't like that answer. That's a, t that's a hard answer. Because, remember, when Jesus said that, the man was still blind. The man, nor the disciples, had any idea what Jesus was about to do. And certainly what he did was unorthodox. I must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had said these things, I am the light of the world to the blind man, to his deaf son as he picked up his hammer and saw. <laughs> when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and he said to him go wash in the pool of Siloam which is translated sent so he went and washed and came back seeing that's bizarre <laughs> spitting on the ground I mean it's, it's the blind man going ooh ooh, ooh that's unsanitary ooh germs see what Jesus points out here to me is even more disturbing because he says the man was born blind for this reason here's the reason here's the reason for all of the suffering 
for all of the tragedy, for all of the struggle, for all of the pain, all of the humiliation, everything that that man and his family had to go through through his entire life up to this point. Here's the reason why that the works of God should be revealed in him. People are going to see God through this. Well, well, we don't ask to have the works of God revealed through us. And Lord, if this is what it means, don't reveal your works through me. Because that's not really where, where I want to go. We, we don't ever ask to have that done. And this man... If, if you would have asked his parents when this man was born and said, you know, the work of God can be revealed in your son, but he's going to have to be blind his entire life. I'm just thinking here, but they probably would have said, well, keep the whole revealing thing. I'll take a kid that can see, right? That makes sense? Okay, you're still here. Good. So, if that's what it is, God just gives the suffering meaning. But it's not necessarily the way to get the meaning that we would think. Lord, isn't there a better way to do this than to cause suffering? Now, we know from the rest of the narrative in John chapter 9 that it turns out amazing as this man is hauled before the Jewish Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of the day, who question him up and down and backwards and forwards about who Jesus is and what he did. And the man was <laughs> I love this guy. Because he's like, what, do you want to become his followers too? Love the guy. Not impertinent. Maybe, uh, I don't know, just... <laughs> I just think he was smart. And he says, look, I, I don't know... All I know is once I was blind, now I can see. That is the testimony of everyone that comes to Christ. That is the testimony of everyone that is saved. Once I was blind, now I can see. Now, before you were a Christian, did you suffer? Remember before you were a Christian and all the things that you went through? And then you got saved. And now you look back on all of those things and say, perhaps... It was worth it if it brought me to Christ. It was a part of my testimony. I can't, I can't hate it because it's my life. I can't be embarrassed or humiliated by it because it's what the Lord allowed me to suffer. It's what he brought me through. So in a very real sort of way, for you and for me, we can look back on that and we can say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for what I went through. Thank you for the suffering. Thank you for the pain. Thank you for the humiliation. Thank you for waking up, passed out on the floor in that bar. Thank you for vomiting my guts out after I had too much. Thank you, Lord, for having to suffer that public humiliation when I was arrested or whatever it may have been. Now you know. <laughs> I remember that guy. <laughs> Because it's those very things that we suffered that the works of God may be revealed in us. And now the works of God are being revealed in us. How, how is that? Because each of us who's been born again by the Spirit of God can now say, once I was that, but now I am this. That's the way I like to put it. You've heard me say it a zillion times. Once I was that, but now I am this. And I would not be this if it was not for that. Right? You have to say that, right? So now, now, when we look at passages like James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, we can say, okay, all right, I understand that. We've got a couple of other interesting passages on the topic too. 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13 go like this beloved I love this passage do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you but rejoice to the extent that you partake in Christ's sufferings 
that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Oh, I'm suffering. Oh, I'm going through trials. Yeah, yeah. And as if that was never going to happen to you or something? As if you were the only one that thought, gee, if I just come to Christ, I'm never going to suffer. I'm never going to go through anything. Don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you or to test you. It's interesting, too. There's a Greek word that sometimes is translated try or test. And it's where we get the English word assay. And that is to judge the value of a thing, to test it for its purity, like to assay a metal. For instance, to assay the value of the gold that you have, well, what percentage purity it is. That's what happens to our faith. Our faith gets tried and tested to assay it, to, to see the value of it. How is it doing? Also, 1 Peter chapter 5, in verse 10, But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while... Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Suffering is a part of the game, friends. You know it, and I know it. We don't like it, but at least it's got a purpose. Now, when we look at James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4, we actually can count it all joy when we encounter various trials. Now, look, there's nowhere in Scripture that says you have to like the trials. Nothing in there at all. As a matter of fact, there's everything in Scripture that says they're painful and they're difficult. But there's a purpose and there's a reason. Both the woman herself and Jairus may have been, right at this point, people on the edge of hopelessness. Driven to desperation by their circumstance. With nowhere to turn. The doctors can't help me anymore. Science and technology can't help me anymore. My religion can't help me anymore. I'm beyond all of those things. I'm past whatever faith I thought I had. I'm past positive thinking. I'm past what any human being can do for me. There's only one place to go now. Both of these people came to Jesus out of, our, out of their desperation. Why do we wait until we're desperate? Why do we wait? Why don't we lead? Pardon? Sinful nature. Sinful nature. I, you know, sometimes I think that that's a. I think that's the answer. But sometimes I think it's because there's a part of us that just doesn't really believe. You know, we have Jesus in our head. You know, but not necessarily in our heart. Yeah, he dwells in our heart by faith, but there's something that's not connecting in there. There's an aspect of faith that's not really connecting in there. And so we say, yeah, 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Yeah, 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 I get a prayer, prayer. Yeah, 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 I know that. Ryan, I think yeah. it's interesting that Jairus was so desperate that he knelt down before Jesus. What, what, does it, what does it take to drive somebody to that point? What does it take to drive any one of us before we'll bend our knee before Jesus? You know, I'm just sorry that it, that it takes what it takes. But now that we're born again, now that we're saved, what does it take? What should it take to lead with prayer, to go to Jesus first, not out of desperation because I've tried everything else, but let's lead with him and then we'll try everything else too. Yes, we're going to go to the doctors. Yes, we're going to do whatever it is that we can medically. But we're going to lead with prayer and we're going to lead with faith in Christ. Now, we'll break here. Because there's too much coming up. Too much. I just, I love this story. Because next we're going to get to why does Jesus ask questions? Why does he say who touched my clothes? Why does he get to that? So to find out why, you're going to have to come back next week. So I know all of you people by name, so you're going to need to be here next week. Let's, uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we're, we're grateful for how you stretch our minds 
You stretch our understanding of your word. You stretch our faith, Lord, and we don't, we don't like the stretching. We like comfort and we like peace. We don't like testings and, and trials. But Lord, you have given us reasons why those things happen. And so we can endure them knowing, Lord, that you are the one that's at work here and you are bringing about something in our life that can only be brought about through the testing. So, Lord, I pray that we would not ever forget that and that we would lead with prayer, that we would lead with faith in you, that we wouldn't just fall back on you when everything else fall, fails. Lord, that we would come to you first and foremost and wait and watch and see what you do through the difficulties that we suffer. So thank you for the grace. Thank you for the mercy. Thank you for the information that we have from your word that encourages us before the trial ever gets here. Lord, thank you for preparing us. Now bless us as we go with this information in our heads. Lord, work it down into our hearts that we can actually believe and do these things. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.